Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you this evening to our Board of Commissioners meeting Monday, May 2nd, 2022. Um, at 5 o'clock, we had a work session, the budget review. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and call the 6 o'clock meeting to order. And our first uh, item is the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. We have no one signed up um, to, um, to lead us in that tonight. And I will say I did speak to a couple um, pastors this weekend, and they're going to be making some contacts to us to hopefully get back in rotation going. So um, do we have anybody who would like to volunteer in the audience to lead us in the invocation tonight in Pledge of Allegiance? Hearing none, I'm going to go to our resource to my right over here, if he would so do us the honors to see you. Heavenly <laughs> <laughs> Father, thank you for this glorious evening. Lord, it uh, followed a glorious day, and what a wonderful time to live in the Kirk County. Lord, I ask that you would bless this evening's discussion, Father, that you would bless our uh, deliberation of the issues before this war, Father, I cry out to you for your wisdom as we discuss, discuss the issues at hand. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every person that has come to uh, watch our meeting tonight. Father, protect them as they travel home uh, following the meeting. And Lord, I ask that your hand would be upon this board. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Thank you, Vice Chairman Beaumont. <clears throat> the next item is our approval of agenda. Do we have any changes or any amendments to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I do. Uh, I would like to um, add to the agenda tonight a discussion on uh, uh, specifically the commissioner uh, participating in the ARPO advisory board. Um, due to work constraints, it is impossible for me to make that meeting. And uh, in the interest of uh, the county, um, would suggest another commissioner take that role. And after earlier discussions, Commissioner White uh, volunteered his service uh, in that role. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that we uh, appoint uh, Chairman White or uh, Commissioner White in that role. Okay, we can add that to the agenda. Uh, Let's add the agenda and then the discussion. <laughs> yeah, so we yeah. did under new business um, after D. I guess we can add that right before the consent agenda. We'll add yes, that sir. in. Okay, uh, any other amendments? Uh, if not, uh, can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item is public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to come before this board three minutes uninterrupted to speak uh, any issue, any concerns, any comments, anything you'd like to discuss with the board, we would give you on a, um, an interrupted time to discuss any matter. I have no one signed up to speak tonight. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak that didn't sign up? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment portion of this, and we're going to move into our commissioner's report this evening. I'm going to start off to my right, and I'm going to start with uh, Commissioner Owen Etheridge. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to pass on tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner McCord. Um, a lot of events in the county. County's busy. Uh, I didn't attend, but I know we had uh, officers of Tennessee Food Festival uh, not found this weekend. Not found. We've had a couple of good events already this year. Mm -hmm. um, cut my mic on. Uh, big car show at New Life Church in Barco this weekend. Um, Last weekend, we had the mud bog. The mud bog had the busiest crowd ever, 12,000 people. It was over 10,000 people. So uh, it was packed. They ran out of room to park people. It was pretty crazy. Um, and it was a great crowd. I will say this. I've worked plenty of mud bogs. And I think myself and the other lieutenant jinxed it because I said, you know, we haven't had a fight. Everybody's behaved. And literally the last 20 seconds of it, I guess two little kids got in a scuffle which led to the dads breaking it up. Then they got into a fight that led into a couple more. And I would like to thank the citizens of the county that helped. When you got two officers versus 10,000 people, sometimes a little tough. But the, the locals helped separate everybody. Um, you know, nobody got hurt. So, But it, it was a good day. It was a nice day. Um, they had celebrities there. Dennis Anderson ran out there. It, it was a good crowd. Um, like I said, there's a lot of good events in the county. Traffic. On the main road, I went through reports of speeding tickets from just the weekend. The traffic is up. People drive crazy. Um, there was a lot of tickets in the uh, weekend uh, issued. 
So, um, or I should say invitations to the court <laughs> judicial center. But like I said, be careful on the roads. Fires are still happening left and right. There was one last night on Knott's Island. Um, like I said, so make sure your house is in order and all that good stuff. And uh, just be careful out there on the roads. And I think that's it. And like I said, oh, happy pre-Mother's Day to mothers. Next weekend is Mother's Day, and we won't have a meeting till then. And anybody that's a mom and all that stuff, happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Commissioner McCord and Vice Chairman Beaumont. Um, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, there, I'm sure there's a rhyme and a reason and a rationalization to paving during Saturday traffic and Friday afternoon, evening traffic headed to the Outer Banks. But the line coming off the beach on Friday last week was miles long because it went down to one lane of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, we may have no say in it. And, uh, uh, you know, Ike is, you know, county manager. If you could please tell us. I mean, really if, check with DOT and see what the uh, contract provides with it, regard to paving on Friday and Saturday. It was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. I'm surprised we didn't have units camped because it was just, it was out of control. And anyway, they are doing better with sweeping the road, though. That that I will hold out. Oh, so there's one windshield this week. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a good day, only one windshield. But that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. And uh, for myself, this evening I have nothing to report. So I'm going to move on to our. Next, Commissioner, Mr. White, Chairman White, I appreciate it, White. Commissioner White. Promoted it's you. Okay, might be. I, knew, I knew you were talking to okay. me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Kevin, you brought up something good on Knott's Island. Uh, one of the things, um, we got one a couple of years ago. It was a brainchild. One of my few things, good decisions, I guess, I came up with or ideas, was in a, uh, an event assistance program in the county. Um, it's up to $20,000, and it's, it's funded through tourism dollars. So the idea is that you bring people into the county for an event, and we help you do that without a lot of risk to you to put on this event and hopefully build some events that can become continuing things, such as the Peach Festival in Knott's Island. They did a seafood festival. Um, we had the... Strawberry um, Blossom the Festival. Strawberry was the other one. Yeah, the uh, Peach Blossom Festival. Yeah, Peach Blossom Festival. It's uh, Martin Farm Vineyard. So... Um, these are just to name a few. You know, we, we, we also help longstanding uh, uh, projects going on so at the vineyard. Um, they did a food truck rodeo, and we, we, we helped with some money with that. So um, if you have an idea uh, for an event, uh, there's some parameters involved, but the idea is that we help you do that and spur tourism here, uh, especially on the mainland where we, you know, we, we look to diversify the economy here, and this is one way to do that. And the money flows back into the county and that it goes to hopefully mostly vendors in this county. That is also another point is that, you know, the money gets paid back into vendors that show up at the event. And so the tourists um, help fund these things and um, we don't have to put, you know, taxpayer dollars after it basically. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there for anyone that's watching that we do have that program in place. And if you've been thinking about an event, um, you know, reach out to tours and they, you, they'll be there to help you. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Commissioner White, we have Commissioner Etheridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to address an issue that was mentioned at our last meeting, and I'm speaking of Facebook warriors and public trust. We complain about what is being said on Facebook and tell folks not to believe everything that they read or hear, but are we as a board doing our best to alleviate the problem? There are small steps we can take that will help to rebuild public trust in government. I've always said change starts with the local government and works its way up from there. According to uh, Curry Tucks County Code of Ordinance, Section 2-86, to uphold the integrity and independence of his or her office, county commissioners should demonstrate the high standard of personal integrity, truthfulness, honesty, and fortitude in all their public activity in order to inspire public confidence and trust in the county government. County commissioners should participate in establishing, maintaining, and enforcing, and should themselves observe high standards of conduct 
so that the integrity and independence of their office shall be preserved. What better way to restore trust in us and our decisions before us is when someone comes in before the board with an issue, we disclose any relationship that we or our family members may have with this individual or their company. An example would be if an individual is before the board for rezoning or whatever, and one of your family members works for them directly or indirectly, it should be disclosed. If that person or their company is doing or has recently done work for a member or a close fam for anyone or a close family member, it should also be disclosed. If we as board want to demonstrate the high standard of personal integrity, we should be fine with these disclosures. I serve on the ABC board and before every meeting a statement is read concerning if we have a conflict of interest. In North Carolina, several county commissioner boards reads an ethics statement before their meeting. The following is from Mitchell County and it says, in accordance with the state government ethics act, it is the duty of every board member to avoid both conflict of interest and appearance of conflict. Does any board member have any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflicts with respect to any matter coming before the board? If so, please identify the conflict or appearance of conflict and, and refrain from any undue participation in this particular matter involved. This is not to limit the voting power of any individual on this board but it is for us to be more transparent. Code of Ordinance Section 274 states, it is our duty to vote unless it involves our own financial interests. A board member should not have any issues with their conduct and therefore should welcome anything that would help to build public trust and confidence in our board. And I for one would like to see an ethics statement read before all of our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Etheridge. Commissioner Jarvis. Thank you. <clears throat> On Tuesday, uh, April 25th, uh, Commissioner Kitty Etheridge and I had the um, privilege of touring the schools with Superintendent Matt Lutz and some of the members of the school board. Um, it was great being back in the schools. Uh, kind of felt like going home, even though we didn't tour the high school that day. Uh, and I was uh, amazed and, and pleased at the state of the buildings. Um, the buildings are very well maintained despite their age, uh, very clean. Uh, I give a shout out to the custodial staffs of Moyock Elementary, Moyock Middle School, uh, Knapp and Shawborough uh, that we uh, toured. And I look forward to touring the other schools at a later date um, and just seeing um, how space is being utilized. I know it's been creative. I know. Uh, we saw some of the rooms that have been transformed, uh, and it was, it was good to see how that transformation is taking place. Uh, I would also like to reiterate uh, a very important uh, decision that we'll have to make tonight. Um, we are going to be uh, considering a resolution that marks May as Older Americans Month. Um, to me, this is a passion. It is a very important decision that we will uh, undertake. I am confident that our board will pass that resolution. Um, starting in June, our Meals on Wheels program with our senior services will be going back to five day a week deliveries. Since the pandemic, we have been doing three days a week uh, and we need volunteers. We need volunteers on all parts of the county. I ask if you can give a few hours of your day, even one time a month, it is so important and it truly is the best thing I do all month. They are so appreciative just to have that contact with one person to uh, ask about their day is so important and it delivers vital meals to our seniors who otherwise would not be able to do that. So let's celebrate our seniors to the accomplishments that they have, to the wisdom that they bring, to the history that they preserve in our county. Uh, I look forward to passing that resolution tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jarvis. Uh, the next uh, item is our county manager slash county attorney report. Um, Mr. Chairman, as uh, 
some of you may know, I'm, I'm a member of the Coastal Resources Advisory Council, which is sort of like a planning board to the Coastal Resources Commission. We met last Wednesday in, in Manteo, uh, had an interesting presentation about the uh, offshore wind farm, which some of you may have know more about it than I do. I was surprised to learn some information that we have kind of been, I guess, told that it's going to be a great uh, benefit to northeastern North Carolina and all the e economic uh, uh, things that we will benefit from. We're surprised to learn uh, that, first of all, it's going to be the, the Avon Grid won the, the lease for the site off of Kitty Hawk. It's going to be developed into two phases, the north section and the south section. Uh, they showed us a map where the north section, it's, it's about 69 wind turbines will be located in that particular phase, uh, but that the tra power transmission line will extend from there uh, into Virginia Beach where it will pick up some substations to, to put the power into the, to the grid. The southern portion, uh, they show two different uh, potential paths for the transmission lines, one all the way down to Moorhead City, uh, and one a little farther north coming across um, the southern portion of the Outer Banks, uh, which the federal government evidently has some problem with coming through there. Uh, but that all the, uh, I guess, material and work crews would be expected to come out of Moorhead City's port as opposed to up this way. So that was kind of surprising to, to hear and, and, and learn of what that plan is. Uh, secondly, um, some folks might think that county only works Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, um, but there are dedicated county employees that are on watch and on duty at all times. Um, in fact, 1045 this past Saturday morning, I received a text from Logan Steese, our IT director, to inform me that we were having some connectivity issues with uh, the Verizon connection to our water plant, which our water operators have to rely upon to operate our pumps that then fill our water tanks around the county. Um, he had tried to contact Verizon about 20 times. He wrote me uh, to get the issue resolved. Um, I inquired, was, were we having a problem with treatment or distribution of our water? And he responded that our water uh, system guys were, in, were having to actually go out and manually operate all the pumps and uh, to make sure that our water tanks uh, were maintaining the appropriate level uh, of water. Um, that issue did not resolve itself until 3.30 Sunday morning. Uh, so we had our water crews and our IT director involved in trying to resolve that issue with Verizon throughout Saturday into the early hours of, uh, of Sunday. Uh, Sunday afternoon, I received another uh, communication from our IT director, Logan Steese, to inform me that uh, CenturyLink um, connectivity to our 911 Central Communications Center uh, had gone out, and while we were able to receive 911 emergency communication calls and to dispatch, uh, there would, was not the ability for our telecommunicators to telephonically uh, call people from the um, Central Communications Center. Uh, that, that matter ultimately also resolved itself, but that's just an example of our people on duty at all times to make sure that services to the County citizens remain uninterrupted to the extent that we're able to do that, um, and so that the citizens don't feel the effect uh, when we have these kind of issues. So I give great credit uh, to those particular crews and team members over the weekend. I'd like to say, I had too, like you said, the water department. There was an issue today at the sheriff's department I saw where somebody had called in something bad happened, where somebody hit something. Will Rumsey and his guys are they're all over it. I mean, they do a really, really good job. So appreciate them and it doesn't surprise me that they were out Saturday they were out that one Friday night they literally had somebody having to sit at the end of Brumsey Road and Tulls Creek Road all night in a truck to repair something I mean like I said so we're very fortunate thank you for your report um, the next item is going to be our administrative reports and this evening we have uh, the Trillium annual report to the Board of Commissioners by Bland uh, Baker of North, the Northern Regional Director. Good evening. Glad you could make it out this evening. Thank you very much for your time tonight on the agenda. I will be very brief. Now, am I supposed to work this or? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And, you know, it's good it all works because I'm very challenged when it comes to all this. So, 
Um, anyway, I, I, I do appreciate your time um, on the agenda. I just want to give you a few updates about Trillium and what's been going on this past year. Since I was here last, we've added two more counties. We've added Halifax County and we've added Bladen County. Halifax came December the 1st and Bladen came uh, February 1st. And this is a result of um, Cardinal merging with another MCO like, like Trillium and they were given the opportunity to move to other MCOs and they chose to come with us and we actually voted to accept them. So uh, we now have 28 counties. We served 58,000 people last year. Um, the services are roughly $475 million is what those services cost. Uh, we uh, manage a network of uh, about 500 providers. Um, we actually have a closed network, which means we um, advertise for providers through uh, an RFP process on our website. And those folks who are interested in applying, they apply and then they're selected based on that. So, so one of the big things that we've been doing, I feel like every time I have come for the last two years, we've been talking about Medicaid transformation. And I'm still talking about it. But we are moving um, more through it. Um, this past May, there were five uh, insurance companies that were awarded the standard plan. So the transformation means that all of Medicaid is going to a managed care uh, system. Trillium has been already doing managed care through the individuals that we've been serving. But so they have awarded, the state has awarded five insurance companies. They'll be managing the standard plans and they'll be managing the mild to moderate Medicaid behavioral health symptoms. That started July 1 of this year, of last year. So um, as we have moved forward, the tailored plan um, was advertised and all of the MCOs were, which is seven of us initially, were allowed to apply and we all were awarded. Uh, we have actually, will be um, managing the more moderate to severe behavioral health symptoms. We will be picking up the physical health of those individuals and we'll be picking up the pharmacy benefits of those individuals, which is something that's gonna be new for us. So um, we're in the process of, of um, hiring a pharmacy benefits manager to help us um, work through that and we'll be contracting, there's about 2,000 uh, pharmacies um, across our 28 counties, we'll be contracting with all of them to be sure that all of our individuals that we serve can get their primary care physician, which we'll be contracting with them as well, their behavioral health. And uh, the main point of all this is that um, it's um, one insurance company that manages all of your services. So you don't have to go to one for one thing and one for somebody else. So the same insurance company that manages your psychiatric medications can do your therapy, can give you your flu shot, and you can get your medicine all from the same insurance company. So that's the, the point of um, this particular type of model of care. And I think when the dust settles, it'll all be a good thing. So I'll just say a couple of things about some of the organizational changes. Um, Lisa Wainwright, I don't know if how many of you all have known her, was at the division for 30 years. She came to work with Trillium and she did retire in February and Joy Futrell is our new CEO and she's been with Trillium for almost 30 years herself in, in finance. So um, she is our new CEO. And one of the other things I wanted to mention, Sue Ann Forrest, um, this is a new position for us. There's so much going on in Raleigh with um, the General Assembly, legislative oversight committees, that we hired Sue Ann Forrest, who actually used to be a lobbyist for the Hospital Association. And she is coming on board with us to kind of help us um, with the lobbyists lobbying for the MCOs and for the counties and for ever what she needs to do to help keep us informed about what's going on um, in Raleigh. Some of the other things um, we have got, you know, we have a, um, a crisis line that we, we um, that's in effect um, 24 hours a day, 365. So when we um, become a tailored plan, which will be in December of this year, um, we actually 
Uh, we'll have a pharmacy line designated strictly to pharmacy types of questions. We'll have a designated provider line for provider issues, a uh, nurse's line, which will handle medical issues, and then, of course, our continue to our, for our call center. <clears throat> One of the great things about the tailored plan, and we're looking um, and updating our care management platform, is because we will be managing the whole person, as I said before, and everybody who is, will be on the tailored plan will have a care manager. That is not the way it is right now. But when we implement the Taylor Plan, every single person that we serve will have a care manager, which is a great thing. We've also um, organized a disaster response unit that's in the process of meeting with um, all of our uh, emergency management departments. Um, they're actually collecting the, um, the responses to um, disaster that providers are required to have so they can monitor those as well. Some of our projects, um, we continue to um, dispense naloxone kits. I know earlier this year we um, believe we were able to get um, 30 of those kits to Currituck County. And um, <clears throat> we actually have done some mobile clinics um, up in this area. There's one in Perquimans County, and as they perfect that, we're hoping that we can move it in this direction and maybe Curry Tuck can benefit from that as well. That will be some substance use services out of that clinic and as well as some um, mental health services. So one of the other things that uh, we have done, we're gonna be hiring family navigators. You know, the mental health system is a horrible system to have to maneuver through. It's just a complicated system and so we're going to be hiring family navigators who already know what that system is like, and they'll be assigned to individuals who are struggling about how to access services through um, Trillium. And so we're working on that as well. Um, so and that was just a few things. So um, ultimately, for Curry Tuck County, last year we served 642 individuals. 496 of those were mental health. 138 of those had substance use issues, and 79 of those had intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I did want to say that um, in terms of what's happened since I was here last year, we actually, um, we've added um, a, a, a counseling, uh, Culpeper counseling. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with them. Um, they're in Jarvisburg. They, we actually ran um, an RFP for some additional counselors in several counties, and we did award um, one to this individual. We actually also have, uh, have a new um, day treatment program that supports the school system, and it's for kids that maybe need more support than what they could get in outpatient therapy. So it's a system that schools can refer those more challenging kids to, to that program. So those are two of the things that, that we've done since I was here last. Um, are there any questions for me? I, the, 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 mental, the mental patient number that in Currituck County, does that include everything where if not just y'all dealt with them, but if mobile crisis dealt with them or the... If, if is, they went through mobile crisis, okay. they, they came through us. Ultimately, even now, even if they were, say, a family member did an IBC on a voluntary commitment on somebody, would they still go through y'all? If if they have Medicaid or they don't have any insurance. So yeah, so probably. Like I said, I, I figured the number was maybe a little bit low. I thought it might have been a little bit more than that. But I, you know, working with y'all on a regular basis, your company does a great job. I mean, you have good people through the mobile crisis through Trillium. And I, one more question. How many trillion billboards are there on North Carolina? They are <laughs> everywhere. I, was, I asked a girl that the other day that worked with y'all. I said, how many trillion billboards are up and down the state of North Carolina now? Do you know? I have no idea. But, I mean, and of course, they change periodically as, as we add new programs to advertise those to let people know other ways that they can access services, not just from picking up the phone and saying, I need some help. But there are other programs that we have that, can support the community, and that's one of the things that, one of the other ways that we kind of. There, I mean, they're seeing. I went to Raleigh two weeks ago for training, and I seen. I mean, like I said, they're, they're, which is a good thing. They're visible. Right. right. 
Bob, any other questions? Question? I think Kitty did. Yeah, I did okay. too. Um, I have a question. I serve on the social service board here in the county, mm -hmm. and our counties had several children in foster care with unmet uh, mental health needs due to a lack of resources okay. through Trillium. As a result, the county's having to pay privately for their treatment and housing. In 2021, we paid $17,629 out of pocket. And 2021-22, we paid 31277 So that's a total of over $48,000 that's coming out of the taxpayer's pocket for these unmet mental health needs for right. children here in the county. Why is Trillium not securing more resources for foster children here in the county when it's costing us so much money and is there services? Well, one of the reasons is because it's hard to get a provider in Currituck County uh, as well as some other counties. And um, so without knowing more specific detail and, and what we can do to help support that, I certainly will report that back to my folks. But we do have an individual named Sean Kenny that is the liaison between DSS, and he specifically works with DSS agencies, all of them, to work on foster kids or any other types of um, children that may have needs that maybe are not being met, and he is a big resource for us to help support that. The other thing I would say, even when we offer uh, enhanced rates to even psychiatrists to get them to come in the area, we can't get them. So we, we do continue, and that's another reason why we were able to add the, um, the day treatment program. It doesn't have to come through the school, but that's usually to support the school. The outpatient therapy that is in the school systems as well, um, that can help support that as well. But um, if you will, we can have a talk, you know, um, a little bit later on, and, and, and I can be able to answer those off the top of my head. It's kind of hard to One say. One of our board members is also here in the okay. audience, and we've had children in foster care who are severely mentally handicapped, and when we get a place for them to stay, it's being denied by Trillium. Okay. And my second question is, with the new King's Daughters Mental Health uh, hospital opening up, are we going to be able to cross over state lines for mental health services? I can't answer about the crossing the state line, but I do know we are very much aware of that new facility opening, and our network department has already contacted them to see if we can work on um, uh, some negotiations around that. I do know that there is some issue about, especially with IVCs, crossing the state line, it's almost impossible unless right. they're military or something. It literally, I mean, we, I deal with that every day. But like Miss Kitty said, too, that number that you gave, we dealt with those on the sheriff's department, and we had to do some transport and drive it, so it's probably a little bit higher. Because, <laughs> you know, when we have to house them in social right. service, we call on the sheriff's right. department sometimes uh, sit in there when they're being housed there and well and it would be nice to know how many times you got folks kids that are sleeping in your lobbies because we if if the dss director calls us we do try to respond and we try to help support them in getting them um, we have some crisis respite homes that we um, are in the process of contracting for those very situations when kids are in crisis or they're in the SS lobby and there's nowhere for them to go or they're in a place that they've blown, um, they'll be able to go to those homes and um, they'll be able to go and Trillium pays the first 14 days of their stay out of our pocket. So, well, the but, one, like you said, one of the ones, I mean, you can't, we can't go into specific cases, but one of the ones, like she said, I mean, we've had to have supervisors, the YMCA was courteous to let them go there and take a shower. They've used the public safety building. I mean, there's there's one case that she talked about where it's extensive. Okay. Well, and again, without knowing, you know, if you and I can have a conversation and you can give me some more specifics, I'll be glad to get those addressed. I'll have the director get in touch. Okay, great. With great, so, great. Um, how do you, uh, how do most people end up in contact with you? Is it, is it through something happened, they came into a hospital, law enforcement, 
you know, are they just walking off the street or call you guys directly? All you know? the above. All the above. However, you know, it is not required that they go through Trillium. Right. So if if they are living in a town and they know on the corner there's somebody that's doing mental health treatment, they can walk right into that office without ever calling us. Mm -hmm. They can get an appointment. Now, eventually we're going to know about it because we're going to be paying for the service. Right. I mean, right. Through Medicaid or, or um, state funds. But um, it's through a number of ways, they, either through mobile crisis or um, an IBC, law enforcement, um, Anybody that is experiencing a crisis, they can call us directly. So it's all the above. Okay. Thank you. Like I said, probably, I mean, a, a, a major percentage of it probably, Bland, wouldn't you say, is through mobile crisis probably? I would, I, I would say so. Like, and, and I would but commend. But I will say this and see, Currituck County is lucky because you all utilize mobile crisis. And they, they are a great service. But we have some counties that don't utilize the medical crisis as they should. And when that happens, I think a lot of people go unserved or they don't get connected to a provider or, or they're, not, they're not assessed appropriately. And so the service is only as good as the county allows them to be. And, and Currituck County has always been a, a huge utilizer of mobile crisis. So. Everybody wins when you use it, in my opinion. I mean, the county, the taxpayer, the individual gets help. I mean, mobile crisis, they'll come to your house, and even if you don't get transported or committed, I mean, they'll set up counseling. I mean, like he said, I mean, they, there's a lot of good programs that saves this county a lot of money as well as well, and helps the we, person. We do have, um, in some of the counties, um, they've met with the magistrates, and the magistrates won't even do an IBC until they call mobile crisis unless it's a sure thing, and they'll send mobile crisis out to do that evaluation, and it could be that somebody was going to do an IVC that it wasn't really necessary, that they can just be connected to a provider, get an appointment, and get them connected into a service. And then sometimes they absolutely need to be IVC, but that keeps the people out of the emergency room, and it frees up law enforcement so they don't have to sit with them in the ED if they got an IVC and they don't really need it or they could have been connected. So there's a lot of uses for mobile crisis that could benefit the counties when on their utilized side. I was getting any other questions from the board? Thanks for what you all do. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker, for coming this evening. Good information. Sure. Thank you. All right. Okay. Our next item under new business, item A, is consideration of North Carolina Statewide Emergency Management Mutual Aid and Assistant Agreement. I believe I can read. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before the board is an emergency management mutual aid and assistance agreement that, if executed by the county, will allow for the county to call on any other county that has also executed the agreement for mutual aid in the event of a declared emergency. Um, this is something we've had in place in the past, and staff recommends its approval to the board. Okay, any questions? So move uh, for approval. Well, we need a yeah, motion for approval from Kevin McCord. Second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Next item on our new business is uh, uh, item B, consideration of revisions to the Currituck County personnel policy. Looks like McCree, you have that one as well. Mr. Chairman, there are, there are two matters before you tonight contained within this resolution. First of all is an amendment to Section 503 of the county personnel policy related to political activity and its restriction uh, for county employees. Uh, as you see uh, on the proposed uh, amendments that they are underlined or stricken as, as appropriate. Uh, most importantly is the addition of uh, number uh, A6 under Section 503, which, for, which would provide that no county employee uh, may serve as an elected or appointed member of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners. Important aspect of, of that provision is, as contained in Section 3 of the resolution, uh, it does not apply to a county employee currently serving as an elected or appointed member of the, of the Board of Commissioners on the date this resolution is adopted uh, and does not apply, uh, but will apply to a county employee who is an appointed or elected member of the Board of Commissioners um, at a time when their term would end, uh, their, their term would end after commencing on the first Monday in December. So what that means, frankly, is 
Commissioner uh, McCord uh, <laughs> does not apply to him. He may continue to, to serve in his current capacity as a county commissioner. And should he be reelected uh, in December, of, uh, in November of, of this year and take office the first Monday in December, uh, it would still not apply to him until the end of that four year term. Could this be brought, brought forth that I did not bring up this provision or whatever to exclude yeah. myself or whatever? This was not, not me. So. Um, the, 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 other, the, the other part of that is uh, a legal theory called incompat incompatibility of office. And so what it, what it does is to ensure that there won't be uh, some point in time where a county employee who is supervised by the county manager uh, becomes an elected member of the Board of Commissioners as well, and, and in that capacity becomes the supervisor of the manager. So that's deemed to be an incompatible office holding, and this would just uh, codify it within our personnel policy. Uh, the next amendment is Section 603, uh, holidays when work is required. This is an issue that was uh, talked about during uh, your recent retreat, and it is to clarify uh, not just now when public safety employees who are required to work on a holiday are paid and how they are paid, but it actually will uh, apply to any regular full-time employee who's required to perform work on regularly scheduled holidays. So that might include social workers who are on call. It might include our public utilities staff who's having to uh, operate a water or sewer plant or have to go out on call on a holiday. Uh, staff recommends this uh, approval of these amendments to the board. I do have one question on the, the first thing that you said. Now, and I know this is happening currently where somebody, I guess, is running for school board. So if somebody's a county employee and they say they're going to run for commissioner in 2024, uh, if they win, they can run, but they can't work for the county manager. Like you said before, so they could they could run. They would just have to resign from their position if they won office, correct? If they were elected or appointed and were sworn into office, then they would, then they would have to resign their okay. county employment. Good for approval. Have a motion? A second. Oh, do we have any? I've, I just also. had a question. Is, is this a common practice? I know the school system here in the county has a, a similar policy. Is this a common practice for counties across North Carolina? Well, I know that Camden County certainly uh, has that. We, we learned during, during some research, Camden County has this provision in their personnel policy. Um, I learned during during this too. Remember, we talked. Me and you talked about it. Gates County actually has, I believe, a captain or a lieutenant mm -hmm. that is an elected official that I didn't know. He's a, a deputy <laughs> sheriff. Is it? So it varies. But it varies. But but again, it, it goes back to the general theory that that we have applied. We just now are now putting it into words in our personnel policy. But we've applied it under the incompatibility of office theory. Is there any other questions from board members before we ask for a? Motion. We have a motion, a second. Okay, we have a motion. Who is the second? From Katie, not, you don't want to change that, good? Yeah. Okay, and we have a second. Who is a second? You seconded it. All right, any other discussions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Okay, next item is item C, resolution supporting construction of the Mid-County Bridge and its continued inclusion in a state transportation improvement plan for the uh, probably for the past 40 years, I guess. Right. 1972. <laughs> okay. 30 years they've been talking uh, about this. Mr. McCree, I guess you I, I, I did not one. go back to count how many times <laughs> the board has expressed its position with regard to the Mid-County Bridge. Uh, but this, this matter now uh, arises out of uh, a, a request from the town of Southern Shores who recently adopted a resolution in support of the Mid-County Bridge uh, along with the town of Duck. Um, and the recent uh, dismissal of the lawsuit against the bridge uh, by the federal district court, which is now pending at the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, that, that Curry Tuck County again express its uh, support for the Mid-County Bridge. As another piece of this, we have been asked by um, Southern Shores, and I think I brought it to the board's attention during the uh, recent budget uh, meeting, uh, to join in an amicus or friend of the court brief to the United States Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in support of the, the state's position uh, and asking that court to uh, affirm the dismissal of the lawsuit uh, by the federal district court. Um, so far, I know that Southern Shores is on board to join Town of Duck, the Duck Business Alliance, and I spoke with the uh, 
Southern Shores mayor yesterday, and she's going to start uh, attempting to rally Kitty Hawk and, and the other Dare County towns in addition to Dare County itself to also join in that friend, friend of the court brief. Um, so, again, we recommend that, once again, Curry Tuck County express its support for the mid Curry Tuck Bridge. Undying. Right. Move for adoption. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay, a motion for a second. Okay. <laughs> well, you just need two. Thank you. How many further discussions? Which I've done probably. <laughs> right. How many times? times? Six times. I would done this. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussions? Okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Would it behoove us to try to pull together a meeting with all the different governmental groups? Talk about strategy. Uh, yeah, in my, well, yeah, I don't know what more strategy can be discussed. It's kind of in the hands of the North Carolina Turnpike Authority and DOT, and I guess we want to take them at their word that they continue to be supportive in uh, pursuing every avenue to, to get this bridge constructed. And our representative told us the funding was still there. And like our $30 million. That's that, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, okay. All right, um, next item is item D. Um, the proclamation uh, make, uh, May 2022 as Older Americans Month. So I guess um, we just need to. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think this is such an important thing that we do that we should read this proclamation. It's brief, uh, but it's uh, certainly uh, impactful and uh, underscores the importance of what we're about to do. Okay. Would you like to go ahead and. I would be honored Thank to read you. it. Thank you. Okay. A proclamation <coughs> designating May 2022 as Older Americans Month, whereas Currituck County includes a growing number of older Americans who contribute their strength, wisdom, and experiences to our community, and whereas communities benefit when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds are welcomed, included, and supported, and whereas Currituck County recognizes our need to create a community that provides services and supports older Americans, need to thrive and live independently as for, for as long as possible. And whereas Currituck County can work to build an even better community for our older residents by planning programs that encourage independence, ensuring activities as responsive to individual needs and preferences, increasing access to services that support aging in place. Now, therefore, the Currituck County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim May 2022 to be Older Americans Month. The Board of Commissioners urge every resident to be to recognize the con contributions of our older citizens, help to create an inclusive society, and join efforts to support older Americans' choices about how they age in their community. Okay. Um, action from this board? I move for approval. Okay. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussions on it? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. The, um, the next item is going to be the amendment to the agenda where um, the commissioner, um, the commissioner for the board of the ARPO, uh, request a reappointment, and I believe, uh, or not a reappointment, uh, re resigned from it, and then appointed to a to Commissioner White. And Commissioner White, you've accepted that, correct? Yes. Okay. Any discussion Second. from the board? Second. Second. First. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You have it, sir. Thank you. Looking forward to it. You got to meet tomorrow at 7. Two challenges. <laughs> right. By the way, Angela may already know. Okay. All right. The next item is the consent agenda. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion passes. And at um, this time, I'm going to go ahead and recess from our regular meeting. And um, I'll make a motion that we go into closed session pursuant to GS 143-318.11A6 to discuss personal matters. Second. I have a second. Any first question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you.